Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to start by taking you back. To gener let's go two generations back and see what a good doctor was meant to be. In the time before penicillin was discovered, there were few drugs and procedures available. So a good doctor knew it all, did it all, setting a fracture, um, performing surgery, um, draw blood. So doctors had to be independent, self-sufficient. Autonomy was the highest value. Fast forward to today, knowledge has exploded. It has surpassed the individual. No longer we are able to know everything about our professions. So now we have a lot of specialists. In order to provide an adequate solution today, from beginning to end, there, there will be a lot of specialists involved. involved. A lot of themes, teams have to be uh, working together. So today, collaboration is one of the highest values that we can have. It's going to be one of the th key things for us to be defined as good professionals. So my aim today is provide you with knowledge how to build and how to create um, good teams, perform and creative, resilient, you name it. My name is Sixel Ruiz. Um, you hear that weird accent because I'm from Mexico, but live in Switzerland. I work for a company called Canoe. I'm a Java champion. And those photographs are from JCrete, an open space conference, which is my favorite one. And the other one is uh, Jay Alba. It's also an open space conference, so I'm involved in in sharing the knowledge and also trying to work with people. And that's the key, working with people. I like to do that a lot. So I'm a software engineer, by the way. This is not a technical talk. I usually do technical talks. But this topic, it's so important to me that, as I said, uh, I have to create a talk about this. How this talk came to be? Early last year, I saw this kind of news headlines, and I was puzzled. And then, obviously, I saw, uh, as I said, I live in Switzerland, so I saw all, even those which are more interesting. Um, and I said, no, I have to go back and see what they are about. Why are so incredible the numbers that they are showing? So I'm that kind of person. I go back to studies, I read manuals, I look into papers, I see statistics. That's part of my personality. So I went into the paper, The Mix That Matters. I totally recommend you to read it. Um, this is from the Boston Consulting Group in cooperation with the Technical University of Munich. And, well, it's quite interesting what they found out. Um, they found out, and a very, very uh, re reliable and interesting in terms of the statistics. The um, slides are going to be available, so don't worry about it. What they found out that four out of six types of diversity had a positive correlation towards revenue, and innovation. The ones that are missing are age and academic background. And I will stay here because otherwise I cover the slides. Um, why? Well, in the paper, which is not very long, they actually say something interesting. And we, when we have very homogeneous groups, we tend to have redundant ideas. It's all about perspective, how compressed or how expanded our perspective is. That depends on how we are going to face problems, how are we going to think about possible solutions. So, and it, this is interesting, even people that have mental health issues always say, when I'm in the worst part of my depression, when I'm having suicidal thoughts, it's because my perspective is so 
compress. I in a tunnel. I have tunnel vision. So that's and that's on, not only when we are talking about mental health issue. That's along our whole life. If we don't have the enough vocabulary, if we don't have the enough concepts, then it's really difficult sometimes to explain the problem, and even more difficult to try to find a solution. So when you have a team that is exactly the same, more, more or less, guess what is going to happen about the ideas they can produce? They are going to be very, very similar, very, very redundant. And if you are looking for innovation, something that is disruptive, then probably it's not going to happen. The other thing that it was, sorry about that, um, they found out is that females managers bring out disruptive innovation. For me, that was not something new or surprising. I kind of expected that. So the bottom line of this article for me was there is 11% of revenue coming from products uh, and innovation. When you have more diversity, gender diversity, in your management teams. So I'm going to repeat that, 11% more revenue. So at this point, we should be asking ourselves, how do we increase diversity? And this is not a new idea. Again, another paper. There has been a lot of empirical data saying that there is problems when you try to increase diversity in your teams. For example, in 1998, the similar attraction paradigm, paradigm explains that heterogeneous group have problems communicating among themselves. So, um, and that's really also apparent because we tend to fall in love. We tend to work with people that look li like us. And that's also very interesting. We are also always looking for a group to belong to, a tribe to be part of. And close-knit groups will develop their own language and their own culture. And outsiders will be distrusted. So of course, researchers found out that, and they could actually measure. But in 2005, there another hypothesis came, and scholars proposed that there was a positive effect of having people with different background, because there was going to be an increased pool in experience, and skills, and networks. And yes, of course, we will have different ideas. So debate was going to be more notorious. And well, as I mentioned before, homogeneous groups usually have redundant perspectives. So heterogeneous groups, uh, if they interact correctly, will solve problems more efficiently. Two different moments in time, two different visions with empirical data supporting both studies and showing something in either side of the spectrum. So how do we leverage all the benefits and avoid the drawbacks? The answer is pretty simple. We have to improve our team dynamics. And that's why this talk, I think it's really important because I'm going to provide you with some ideas, factors, conditions that are going to help you regardless if there is diversity in your team. But if there is diversity in your team, you are going to improve your solution delivery. So again, another paper. There are plenty of companies that has, have invested a lot of resources into this. 
For example, Google uh, spent more than two years analyzing 180 teams. And let me tell you how this came to be. Um, at Google, you can imagine, they, they know how to generate, keep, and analyze data. And when they sat down with the managers, they asked them a very simple question. How, we should, how should we form teams to make them good? And some of them answer, well, we should have in our, in our teams people that share hobbies, for example. We should have um, teams where people have the same personality traits. So like, for example, a team of introverts. There was other ideas or other experiments where they have the same profile of teams. That in, in one case, they were very, very successful. And the same profile in a different area didn't achieve the same results. So that was not the clue. So they recruited a lot of sociologists, psychologists, researchers. And what they found out was what is more important is not who is in the team, it's how the team behaves. Again, team dynamics. And they actually, from the 250 different key elements that they tracked, they boiled it down to the five keys to a successful goal team. And those are the five keys. Psychological safety. This has to do with how confident, how good do I feel when I ask questions, uh, when I seek feedback. And they actually have these five questions, because there are five questions, as a survey. And they continuously fill them out. And they review the answers. And if they have more than not positive answers, they will have to reward in their team dynamics. So dependability, can I count on my team members that they are going to deliver work on time and with high quality? Do we all know what we are trying to achieve here? Does it matter to me? Is this important for somebody else? As I said, for me, the most important one is psychological safety. And psychological safety sometimes is thought about like trust. Yes, they share a lot of things in common. But trust is something we build between individuals. So for example, I trust my friends. I trust my mother. In our work, it's interesting. Um, we should trust our colleagues based on experience and knowledge. And think about that idea. We will come back to that one. Um, again, psychological safety. If I'm in an environment where I feel safe, in terms of I'm going to be respected, my ideas are going to be heard, I don't have a problem asking questions, nor pointing out mistakes. And in this paper, um, well, let me go back on this. Uh, in this paper, they use a very interesting example, operation room hospitals. So they compare, for example, two hospitals. And in one, the nurses had, well, the doctors had op open door policies. That meant that the nurses can, could go and ask questions. In other hospitals, there, was not, there wasn't this kind of policy. So nurses and doctors felt very disconnected. One nurse said that she will never ever question or criticize a decision made by a doctor. Other nurse actually said, I don't have a problem by pointing out or confirming the dosage of a drug because, I've, because this could be a life or death 
matter. So as you can see, the how do we build the environment in, the, in, in which we work? Actually, it's very important. As I said, trust is a feeling, a distinctive uni, un, human experience. And the other important part of trust is that we trust people that believe in what we believe. Because then we feel more confident to go outside and experiment new things. Because I know that there is somebody in my community that shares my beliefs, that is going to help me in case I failed, and will, as I said, have, have my back. Um, because when you try something new, you put yourself in a vulnerable position. Why in a vulnerable position? Because you open the door to failure. And there's another really big topic about how do we react and how do we learn about our reactions. For example, if you have heard about emotional triggers, you know that they are very, very important because I can work under pressure. That's not a problem. How I'm going to react when there is a problem, where, when I'm un, under a stress, that's my emotional trigger. If I have a negative reaction, um, that's when you're going to know it. So for example, in my teams, they know already what is my emotional trigger. In my case, uh, it's respect or the lack of it. If we are in a discussion and suddenly someone disrespects another person, I get mad. So remember that joke that you should come with a user manual and actually have it. And people that work with me already know that if we are under stress, we are trying to meet the deadline, there is a lot of discussion and if somebody starts, the best way to make Ixchel go to her corner and stop talking and even reacting is by disrespecting her or somebody else. So this is important. We should always be aware of what are our emotional triggers and the emotional triggers of the other people that we work on. What are the five factors that we can implement to achieve a psychological safe environment? Well, it turns out that we mimic behavior if our leaders, and this is also a very interesting um, difference. A leader is not the person with the most authority. A leader is the person who has the most influence on some topics. So we all can be leaders disregarding of what level of authority we have. And if our leaders show us that they are open to suggestions, if our leaders invite input, uh, they show that actually making mistakes, it's part of being human. And if a mistake appears, an error occurs, then we have to be open about it, increase our communication, and then we can start solving it. Practice fields. This is exactly what I'm talking about. We need forums where we can practice and reflect on the outcomes. For example, uh, returning to the original paper with the two hospitals. One hospital actually, when implementing a new e operation procedure, um, had a dry run. It meant that the entire team will meet and they will do the procedure from beginning to end without the patient on the operation table. And at the beginning of the surgery or the mimic surgery, he actually, the, the surgeon will actually say, 
we can make mistakes because this is the first time we're going to do this procedure, so don't worry. He introduced himself by first name and make everybody introduce themselves by first name so they could talk. In the other hospital, they introduced the same procedure without any previous meetings. So the first time they went into the operation room, it was the first time the entire team met, and there was no chit-chat, no... It was like, everybody read the document, yes, then let's start. And organizational context support. This refers to how do we share resources? Does all your team member have access to the same resources, the same tools, money, investment? Um, if there is a symmetrical information system, we tend to be worried about the fairness of the system, so people will react negatively to it. So mind how the resources are distributed, make them transparent. An emergent group dynamics. This is not something that we can do, this is something that we have to have in mind. In any organization, in any corporation, there will be uh, some kind of role playing, like the father, the mother, the favorite son, and the black sheep of the family, it tends to happen. So of course, how do we appreciate an idea that is coming from the favorite son? It's going to be totally different uh, how the idea is going to come from the black sheep of the family. So we cannot do something about it, except for making it explicit and at least have it in mind that we are doing that. What happens if we have a safe environment? Well, it turns out that you don't have a problem seeking help, asking for feedback, speaking up about errors and concern, and because everybody is going to be involved, then there is less resistance when there is a new procedure or idea to be implemented. This is important to keep in mind, and I will recommend you uh, this book, because feedback can come into three different ways, and it's important that you understand how feedback is composed, and if you have problems uh, understanding or taking feedback, um, this is a great book, actually. I'm not going into feedback and the importance of each of these components, but it's a talk in itself, actually. And it's not only getting the feedback, as I said, and defining what type of feedback you're getting, quality is also important. Margaret, Margaret Hefferman, actually, when she speaks about social capital, and she says that conflict arises when candor is safe. So we want to have more new ideas, then we have to make it easy for them to emerge. We have to make a safe environment. And I love this idea from her. No idea is born fully formed. It emerges a little bit as a child is born, kind of messy and confused, but full of possibilities. And imagine if we don't express this perfectible idea. Why don't, if we don't give us and our team members the chance to put a little bit of themselves, to foster this idea, and then maybe we can create or perfect a little bit more our ideas. And of course, if I feel comfortable, if I feel secure, then I can express my creativity easily. 
I want to share another article, another paper, very, very interesting. In this one, the authors, they run nine large international um, projects and they interview 4,200 different uh, team members and managers. And what they found out, actually, that Jake Richard Hackman's enabled condition, Richard Hackman starts studying about enabled conditions and teamwork in the 1970s. So after 40 years of research, he did that. Um, um, he actually came out with the same idea almost as Google. It doesn't matter who is in the team, what it matters are the enabled conditions in which we can work. And the authors saw that three of Richard Hackman's enabled conditions were still critical in today's team dynamics. And they added a new one because they saw that we have two corrosive problems. One is us versus them thinking, that I already explained a little bit about that concept. And the other one was with teams that are so widely distributed, uh, sometimes we don't share the same resources, we don't share the same team, uh, time zone. So we have to increase our sense of the team as, as a whole. I wanted to summarize, summarize both articles because they are very similar. They are extended in different um, years. But as you can see, there are overlapping um, ideas here. So. Let's suppose that I'm already working in the most safe environment. My ideas are going to be welcome. I'm going to get constructive feedback. I can raise my hand at any point and say there is a mistake, I have a doubt. But I'm leaving, something, I'm leaving out something very important. The me, the I. Me, <laughs> I, as an introvert, will not be very inclined to raise my hand so often. So that's why I think it's really important when we talked how our personalities actually influence how we work in a team. So I'm, there are several um, questionnaires and models that you can find out there. Maybe you have heard about Myers-Briggs, the big five. There are plenty. I like Ocean. There are two reasons why I like Ocean. Um, it, has, it can be applied to different countries and different cultures, and it has a set of valid and reliable skill to measure the different uh, factors or the different um, dimensions of the personality. These are the dimensions. Uh, I want to point out that this is in a spectrum. So we rank in some place of this spectrum. And you may already be very aware of this one, Carl Jung, extroversion versus introversion. And Carl Jung actually said, you cannot find or it's very difficult to have pure extroverts or pure introverts. So we, as I said, this is a scale. We will be located in some place in this, in every one of this dimension. So openness. I'm going to start with one and describe the concept of either one side or the other of the dimensions. In, case, in this case, openness. This has to do how willing we are to try new things. As I said, if we are very willing to try new things, we sometimes expose ourselves because if it's new, then we are vulnerable, then oh, if it's new, we can fail, and then we feel vulnerable. And people that are high on openness are usually 
um, associated with mental flexibility, cultural aptitude, and intelligence. And how willing we are to think outside the box and be vulnerable. Conscientiousness. We like to follow uh, goals. We take a lot of responsibility. And actually, I wouldn't say we, because I do not a high uh, rank very, very high on this one. And they follow through of plans. This is the most uh, known one, extroversion or introversion. And this has to do of how we look into um, how do we acquire energy from our surroundings. There are people that require to be close to a lot of people to feel energized. Introverts were usually, will usually be people of few words. And, oh, sorry. And again, okay. And uh, more reflective and will try to avoid loud noises. Agreeableness, while introversion and extroversion talk about how do we seek um, people or the energy from people, uh, agreeableness, it's about our predisposition. How are we open to, in, to in, um, start an interaction with other people? Neuroticism. If you go and look into this, it's usually described as awkward, affected neg by negative emotional states, moody, and I particularly didn't like this description. And in recent years, there has been a lot of studies about how neurotics are actually very good in your team. And there is one particular study by Corinne Bendesky. Uh, this, she's a professor of, of the UCLA uh, School of Management, the downfall of extroverts and the rise of neurotics. Why? Well, it turns out that neurotics are very mindful about the social perception you are going to have or the other people are going to have of them. So they will tend to underpromise and overdeliver. So that's also another really nice story. And she actually keeps tracks about how neurotics actually increase during the team um, life, their ranking. At the beginning, people are very, very attracted by extroverts. But sometimes these extroverts make a lot of promises and their contribution at the end of the project is not as high as our expectations were. And it turns out that the neurotic actually do not like to promise anything at all. But it, because he wants to make a better impression, he's very worried about what other people think of him or her, they will actually, at the end of the project, will deliver a better um, result. As I said, I chose Ocean for two reasons. One, because it was applicable to international, well, to different countries and different cultures. And the other reason was because InfoQ actually interviewed Brian, Dr. Brian Little, the person behind Ocean. And the interview was obviously about software development, how the personalities actually influence software development. And we already have some ideas. For example, in our teams, we all have this person who likes to try the newest library, who is always looking at the red, shiny toy, and will 
try to figure it out how to include this new library, this new framework into our project. We also have um, a team member that is very, very eager to create commit templates. Like we are going to spend one hour defining how a commit should look like. If we should use a spacers, a space or tabs. What is the format we should be following? We also need extroverts in our teams because you will like people, that guy that is always willing to organize meetings, that is using Slack, HipChat, Mail, Skype, and he's always looking for new kind of um, meetings or activities for team formation, which is good. We all have people in our teams that say, this pink circular button is not the red circular button that I asked or that we agree on. So that's good. And of course, you probably want neurotics in your team because they will particularly sensitive to patches, bugs. They could think about all the things that possible that can possibly go wrong. And so sometimes you really want to have people on that. But that's my whole point. You have certain personalities that will work better in certain um, characteristics of software development. And also, this is really important, because if you understand what's your personality, how do you rank in all the different dimensions, not only that, you know how your team is ranking in the different dimensions. You know their emotional triggers then you will understand that you behave like you behave because of a particular reason. And the other person is going to behave because of a particular reason. This is nothing new. This is actually common sense. Reaching this conclusion that not because I can do a thing, it means that everybody can do it the same way. And you will also understand that the introverts in your team will not be very overly excited about having a lot of team activities. And also, you will notice that, for example, for me, after events that require a lot of socialization, I will be super tired. And Andres, my husband, won't be able to strike a single word from me for three or four hours because I'm going to be exhausted. Can we change? Are we doomed? Is this something that we were born, it was born in our soul and that's it? No. It actually, we actually evolve all the time and even in a small amount of time, we can do something out of character. We usually do these things out of love or because we are required by our job. And this is called by Dr. Little as the free traits. But contrary to its, their name, they are not free. They actually have a very high toll on us. And if we're in that mode, in a free trade mode for an extended period of time, we're going to burn out. So we need to have restorative niches. This is places where we can unwind, get out of this free trade, and indulge in our more natural trades. That's exactly what happens when I need to go into the extrovert part of my personality, which is not very high, I can do it 
for a conference, of course I can do it. Even people start telling me, you are not introvert, you are a super extrovert. And I say, yes, I'm an extrovert right now. But two days from now, it's impossible to locate me. I disconnect email everything. I don't want to talk to people anymore until I can go back again into my balance. So this, full, this talk, it's about diversity is important, really important. Not because we have to do it. Not because there is not enough women in tech. Not because we don't have LGTB um, representation in software development. It's because we have to expand our perspective. We have to increase our vocabulary. We have to find innovative solutions. And this only will happen if we have ideas, vocabulary, concepts. And this, the most sure way to do this is by allowing people that is different from us, listening to them, welcoming them, and saying, I want to learn from you. And also, of course, you can increase the diversity in your groups by changing this, by also changing this. And you will get a nice team composition that will probably solve your problems. Not only the traditional ones, but the not traditional ones too. That's it. We have nine minutes left, and is there any question? If, yes. Yes. Well, in my case, I'm going to work better if they already know that what are my strengths and what what are my areas of opportunities? And I have learned that if I increase the transparency in my work, I actually can work better, and they know how I'm going to behave. So this conversation, I usually have it with some of my team members. Um, actually, these kind of topics really interest me, and I go so deep, is because, to tell you the truth, I have a problem reading social cues. So I really wanted to have a book where they could say, you are asking too much questions. You are asking too much private questions. You shouldn't talk about these topics. And that's why when you interact with me, it can be kind of a trip. Because if I'm, I'm really going to be interesting in everybody. I, I find people fascinated. Fascinating. And then I start asking questions, sometimes very personal. And I also answer them. I put myself in a vulnerable position because I want to build trust with people, to understand what really makes them wake up in the morning and go to the jobs. What are their dreams? What are what are they passionate about? How do they express their passion? And these kind of questions are not very easy to answer. So sometimes people will look nervous. And I, I, in my mind, it was like, should I stop? Am, am I too intrusive? And then I was very anxious about this. So whenever we start having this conversation, I res sorted into saying, you know, you can say stop at any time, and I won't take it, but I don't read social clues so well, so if you are very, very specific, then we are okay. Don't expect me to, don't expect of me, like, I can stop without help. 
So I wanted to find a book, and I wanted to learn about how do we interact. I wanted to learn about how people work. I wanted to learn how different my mind was. So for me to understand that is, to, for me to understand how I behave, is by learning how you behave. So yes, I share that a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so you were talking about you sharing things about your personality with your team, but do you encourage your team members to do the same amongst each other? And in your experience, have you found any resistance in, in doing so? And how did you approach that? Thank you for that question. Uh, one of the most, the best ranking companies according to Glassdoor is Ben Matters. This is a consultant uh, company which has been ranked as the best place to work. And actually, the first day when they go into their company, they take a clinic and they learn about their personalities. And before even a team is formed, they do this kind of exercises. So yes, I do encourage people to do it. Sometimes when I start talking about it, when I start showing them very interesting videos, um, they get, what I try to do is infect them with the curiosity, with the question. And I said, I, I have this, this is like my user manual. And they are like, oh. How did you do that? And I explained, well, you can take this. There is this really nice article. And there is this very interesting video. And they start like, OK, that sounds good. And well, for me, it's simple. I, as I said, I have my how it shall behave under normal circumstances. What is it shall good at? What you should avoid when interacting with Excel. <laughs> and if that happens and we are in a stressful situation, then this is going to be the outcome. So, yes, I have had a lot of success. My team actually likes to do it. Oh, yes, I have, I can recommend you two really nice studies about how, um, there's one by the Harvard Business School that actually treats about, talks about that. How do we negotiate? And they actually follow, um, it was, um, it was in a study based on the uh, ONU, yeah, U UN negotiation process. So it's real. I, I will send it. As okay. yes, yes, because yeah, of I course. Wasn't thinking about the negotiation on the side. I was thinking how to find the people of a different uh, diversity in the team. How to find diversity in the team? Yeah, because when uh, what usually happens is that someone interview, and when you interview someone, you send it to one someone that is similar to you. So. The, the one that's basically doing the interview for the company basically selects all people that are similar to Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I love when in an interview somebody tells me, you are not a fit for our team. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what you should be looking because if you want to solve a different problem, you need somebody that can bring a different idea. Because if you have a problem and you haven't solved it with the people that it's already in your team, chances are that you won't find it. So I, this is about education. People have to make this jump and realize what is common sense. Educating me here. But yes, thank you very much. <laughs>